here this summer, obviously. Um, Beth Fox is going to handle setting up meetings in, in my absence. So if you need anything, she'll be here shortly. If you need anything this summer related to this group, um, just get in touch with Beth Fox and the University of Communications. Um, so the, today on the agenda, we have Annabelle Leiserson from the Cancer Center, and she's generously agreed to just give us an update on a whole lot of things. And I'll just <laughs> leave it to her to, to get into all of that. And then when Annabelle's done, um, John Brazel from ITS is here, and he'll give us an update on the university's plans for uh, video streaming. Um, he is videotaping this today. I'll send out an email afterwards once it's out um, so you can share it with anyone who wasn't here who might be interested. But no further ado, Annabelle. So, um, so I just told Melanie I would speak about what's happening on the web. and. You know, there's so much happening. I think that um, there's never been as fast a rate of change as there is in, in our world in web technologies. I don't think there's, I mean, literally ever. Um, so I tried to just pick things that have been happening in the last few months, since, since 2010, especially in the last two weeks, a whole lot has been happening. Um, and let me see get my machine to work here. So we've got highlights of 2010 and if you, it, it seems to me like the, the great big picture, um, most everything is coming out of our country but it divides into two camps. We have on the west coast, um, we've always had Microsoft it seems to me but these days, it reminds me of the uh, British Empire towards the end of, of you know, <laughs> as the British Empire was crumbling, Microsoft, uh, that, that's what it, the image that comes to mind for me. With Apple, and this is why I don't want to be videotaped, um, it seems to me like it's a crazed dictatorship. Um, Google, you know, I think it's what we all want to be. Um, and, then, and then you have Facebook. Um, so I, I, a few years ago, I read this wonderful book called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Western World, and it's a rethinking of Genghis Khan. Well, Mark Zuckerberg reminds me of Genghis Khan. He's the Genghis Khan of the web world, doing just amazing things in the last two weeks especially. So then you have over on the East Coast, and it's almost like a different dimension because you've got all this wild corporate stuff going on. And then you've got MIT, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the W3C and, and, and standards. And it all feels very boring, but of course it's what's, what fuels all the stuff that's happening up above. The results, is, the results are that you have, um, uh, it's so funny, a couple of years ago I was talking about, you know, why can't we get out of this IE6 um, trap, well, guess what? My wish has come true. And the result is browser chaos, operating system chaos, hardware chaos, and especially you see it with the mobile web. So these are things that I'll be talking about. And ultimately, we've got Barbie's new career. She is um, not a webmaster, but she is now a computer scientist. I thought you all would want to know. <laughs> we're, we're really hot. Um, so let, let's start with Google and what's happening with Google. Uh, it's odd. You, you see, like, sort of two things being said about Google. At the one end, you've got the American Dialect Society, whoever they are, saying that that Google, the verb, is the ver the word, the verb is the word of the decade. Then you have articles like this, Mashable, just yesterday, I think it was, saying why Google and search won't dominate for the next decade. Um, they don't say Facebook, but I would think if there's any reason that it won't, it would be Facebook. Then you come back to just a month or so ago, uh, Wired is saying that Google's algorithm rules. Um, meanwhile, you've got um, Google versus China, and that's really beyond um, the scope of what I want to talk about, because what I'm mostly focused on is stuff that'll be useful to us. So this is fascinating stuff, but it's, it's beyond my scope. Android, however, is very much within our scope. Android, um, it actually started to first be released and talked about right about the time iPhone came out, but it only was last fall with the release of Verizon's Droid that it, it really came into its own, and it, use of it is shooting way, way up. Um, we'll come back to that, too, in a minute. Mostly, though, Google is all about speed these days. Um, so we've got Chrome, where they, 
it's lightning fast and, and increasingly popular because it's so fast. They rebuilt the JavaScript engine from the, the ground up. Those two incredible Norwegian guys did that. Um, <laughs> they're even, lately they're talking about getting rid of, uh, or not showing, the HTTP colon slash slash. They say it's unnecessary. Um, so, but most important, um, they are starting to use site speed in their algorithm. This is something we all need to be paying attention to. Um, they say that at this point, it's only 1% of sites that are affected by this. However, they change their algorithm according to Matt Cutts um, literally every day. And I, you know, the writing's on the wall. So here, and I will be putting this up. It's actually already on the web, but I'll, I'll give you all the link to it later on. Um, here are ways, if you've got concerns about your site speed, um, here are things you can, resources for you to go to to learn how to um, increase, to improve performance. I love Smashing Magazine, and that's a wonderful article. Um, here are a couple others. This, the, second, the, the third one is some guy named Robert. I don't know who Robert is, but he's got all these fabulous tools for minifying your, your code, um, which is a great way to, to speed things up. Then there's Google Webmaster Tools itself. If you haven't been in there lately, oh, geez, you can't see it here on the screen. Um, the, it's over in the, it's really actually in the upper left. You can't tell from, from the, with the projector, but. Um, yeah, right. So it's, it's in the Google Labs, and the last thing is site performance. Let me see if I can in any way get this down so you guys can see it. No, I can't. Um, it, it shows you, the, this is going to be a problem with this presentation in general, because we're not going to be able to see parts of the slide, but oh well. Um, uh, I, would, I would encourage you to go in and look at your site performance. Let me see if there's some way I can get this smaller so that you can see more. I think if I shrink it, maybe. Um, no, it's still not showing the bar. Oh, well. Um, so for, for Microsoft, um, here, there's a whole battery of articles that have come over, out over the last uh, two or three months about uh, the death of IE6. Um, it's a lot of it is Google, and we'll get into why Google is dropping IE6 soon. But it's not just I. It's not just Google dropping IE6. Uh, but lastly, you do have Microsoft itself. Um, they've got like a pre-alpha release of Internet Explorer 9 out there that you can look at. Uh, they've, they've put the emphasis on two things. This is great. They put the emphasis finally on standards, and it, they really are seriously doing standards this time. And they've also, they too are speeding it up by rewriting the uh, JavaScript engine. However, um, it's only going to work on PCs. It's not being developed for Mac as a little you know, the last that I heard. That's a, that's a source of concern. Okay, now we get to Facebook. And uh, a week ago Wednesday, Mark Zuckerberg at the F8 conference um, announced what he called the Open Graph Protocol. I would encourage all of you who have jobs like mine to go in and look at this thing. I'm, I think this is true that Facebook can't be stopped because nobody understands it. When you try and go into the Open Graph Protocol, it is um, not easy, but it's really important. Let me see if I can pull it up for you. You can see it's, it's, uh, it's actually, to me, it looks like this is the semantic web finally really happening. It's, it's based on metadata and um, their own standards that they, they're developing, their own tagging, that kind of thing. Um, so... There is an article here, this is from Read Write Web, this Facebook and Open Graph that I would encourage you to look at um, that has the best explanation that I've seen of how to actually, how and why to pay attention to Open Graph. Uh, here's another reason to pay attention to it, though, is because in just a week, 50,000 websites have done it, um, have started... Explain what it is. Well, let me, let me show you CNN. Here's an example. Um, you can, oh, jeez. It's over here. Um, when you use Open Graph on your website, 
uh, you and, and somebody is signed into Facebook, instead of just seeing this generic um, feed of information from Facebook, you'll see pr your friends. And you'll see your friends talking about whatever topic it is that, that they've put in the metadata. So if it were, say, um, a, a music site, you could see music that your friends recommend. If it were a book site, if it's, say, Amazon, and they, they use this, you can see um, out of Facebook books that your friends are recommending on Facebook because of the way that Facebook tags and then the way you've tagged this. That's my best understanding um, of, of what's going on with it. Um, and I, you know, I was trying this morning to think about whether Vanderbilt should, I'm pretty sure the cancer center's not ready, but you know, your site maybe is a good candidate for, for Open Graph. I really don't know. Um, for for um, Apple, <laughs> um, of course there's the iPhone and now, now the iPad, uh, but one of the things that, that Apple is driving developers the most crazy about is the way that they, for their app store, you have to go through this, essentially a level of censorship. They, they have complete control, their dictatorship here, of who gets in and who doesn't. One, you know, a month or so ago, anybody who had the word Android in their app couldn't you know, pass the, uh, uh, app, the app store um, uh, standards and their app wouldn't be sold through the app store. Um, then you've got this other thing. I assume you all have heard about um, the iPhone 4 model being lost in a, in, in a bar and Gizmodo buying it from the person who took it for $5,000 and then the police coming and raiding um, the author, the Gizmodo author who wrote about Apple, the new iPhone. Uh, they, you know, they busted in his door. Well, this this wouldn't be that relevant to us, except John Stewart has picked it up. Now, John Stewart has, has you know, kind of the iPhone audience. He, he, he there's a, there's a huge overlap there, and he does a m marvelous job of um, talking about the problems with Apple. Um, and you know, TechCrunch's point is that that John Stewart's really going to make a difference. The fact that that uh, Apple is driving developers crazy by virtue of their dictatorship. You know, the average person, average iPhone user won't care about that, but they are going to care about this. Um, then yesterday or the day before, Steve Jobs actually uh, released his thoughts on why not to use Flash. That's, that's a big theme that's been going on. I could personally, I could kind of see it with the iPhone. But with the iPad, I don't get it so much why he's not using Flash. Um, what he said was, and number one reason he gave, and this just leaves me speechless. Mm -hmm. he, <laughs> he said it's because it's proprietary. This is Steve Jobs talking about <laughs> not using something because it's proprietary. It, it, it's just, it's craziness. Um, and. His second reason is um, that ab about really using the full web, and what he's really talking about is two different things. He's talking about flash video versus HTML5 and the H264 encoding. This is where you hear, oh, HTML5 will replace flash. Well, maybe. And then he's got uh, flash games versus his, his app. Um, He's, he talks about security. Yeah, that, I suppose, is true. Battery life is what he used to talk about, but now it's rated number four in terms of importance. Touch, that's, that's a legitimate one. Flash isn't really designed for touch. But then he basically doesn't want third parties um, able to develop iPhone apps. He wants everybody to do it all in Objective-C, as I see it. So, um, so let's go on to, to web standards here. and. Uh, there are really two parts to the web standards, what's coming out of the W3C. There's HTML5 and there's CSS3. So with HTML5, there was a great article in um, Read Write Web again about does HTML5 really beat Flash? You know, this is one of his big reasons. Um, and this was only about a month ago that this came out, and it was an expert testing it. And the answer is, it depends. Sometimes Flash is, is faster. Sometimes HTML5 is um, faster. Uh, for, for actually, you know, 
coming back and looking at the big picture of HTML5, because HTML5 is about a lot more than just video. Um, a couple years ago, Alista Part had a great introduction to it. Um, now there's another introduction here from SitePoint. This is my favorite of the intros, though. Even though it's called in the future of the web, it's basically um, an intro to HTML5. Um, that's a video version right there. So I tried to go through things that you probably are going to want to know about HTML5 um, on the ground if you have a job that's similar to, to mine. Yes, it won't be fully um, uh, out there until the year 2022. However, you can start using it now. And um, the reason that it's really so popular is not just Steve Jobs and video, but that it's built for web apps. This is why Google is backing out of IE6. Things like um, Gmail, um, Google Reader don't work that well in IE6, whereas their own native Chrome is built for, for web apps, and they're using HTML5 um, in, in there. Um, it starts, though, with the doc type. I, you know, most of us know those huge long lines of code for the very first line of code in your web pages. Well, that's the new doc type. It's just breathtakingly simple. Um, uh, the syntax in general is, is pretty similar to um, X, uh, to X, XHTML, but it's, it's just slightly different. You, you'll want to get to know that. The structural element piece, you can see over here there's a, there's a picture of the different structural elements. So instead of doing div ID equals header, you can do just header, and you've got a, just a nav. Got an aside for sidebars. You've got articles and footer tags. Um, th this is... Uh, uh, you wouldn't want to use that, though, today, or I wouldn't want to use it for, for my site because it doesn't work right in IE6. It does the, the structural elements. I do think work right in IE7, but you have to do JavaScript hacks to get it to work in IE6, and personally, I'm not willing to go there. Um, so, And I'm not doing web apps, but some of us in this room are doing web apps, and HTML5 may be something those of us doing web apps in this room would want to be using it pretty much right away. The other thing about HTML5, and this of course has to do with the web apps, is what they modestly call a number of APIs that the W3C is coming out. It's a huge number of APIs. There's the video, there's also audio. Um, there's, there's a way so that you can do things like Gmail offline through HTML5. Drag and drop, very cool. The geolocation, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there uh, for those of us who do web apps. Um, then, then moving on to CSS3, uh, the, there, there are a bunch of good introductions to it as well. Um, here are a few of them. Uh, this actually is the, the W3C itself, and it's, it's surprisingly approachable and useful. You, you can see it, it's rolling out um, steadily. Parts of it are already in use, and more importantly, browsers, certain browsers are using CSS3 uh, more. Uh, th this is a, a fantastic little tool where, which you can use if you want to do some of the CSS3, where you can just put in what you want it to do. It doesn't show well on the projector. Uh, but, it, you know, if you want to use things, and I'll show you in a minute the kinds of things you might want to be considering using on your websites with CSS3, that's a great site to go to. So it is being released in what's called modules. They used to just release it all in a chunk, but there's so much to it that these modules are coming out. And that was what you saw in that graph, the different modules and the, the state that they are in terms of release. Uh, the um, borders, uh, this the border radius will actually make you know curved corners on your um, website. You don't have to do all these crazy hacks to, to uh, CSS to, to get nice curved corners. You don't have to use JavaScript. Um, the, the shadows, you can, sh you know, the same thing. The, the boxes that you're putting curvy corners on, you can put a shadow, but you can also put shadows on text. And some of the stuff you can do right now. A font family. Um, Personally, I'm kind of sorry about this. I like it. I'm one of the few probably in the room. I really like it. There, there are only about three fonts out there that you can use on the web right now. This, this opens up the whole world of fonts. As long as you know, you're not violating copyright, you can attach code. And as long as the browser accepts this, um, this line of code, you can use any font you want. 
Um, it does columns. That's pretty handy. This is a great one. It does multiple backgrounds. You know, until now you can only do one background element, um, but or one background per element. Now you can do lots for for any given element, which is fantastic. You might want to look at gradients personally. That one I'm not as interested in. So let's, let's talk about the, the browser chaos, the thing I was talking about before and the death of IE6. Here's what it looks like at the Cancer Center, and we are trailing edge. I assume if this is what it looks like with us, that on the rest of your sites, it's like this or even more so. So Internet Explorer 8 is the number one, and, and 7 is a close behind. Firefox 3, Internet Explorer 6, look, down to 15%, even, at, um, even with us. And, and we still have a lot of people using star panels, so that's pretty amazing. Um, Safari, Chrome, and here, this really interests me that mobiles now account for uh, over 1% of use, even in BICC.org. So here are the actual operating systems. Of course, it's Windows, and, but it's down here. Now, iPhone is ahead of Linux. I thought that was interesting. Android is up and coming. I, and iPad. iPad is, somebody's using iPad to access. It's not me either. So they may have to buy me an iPad so that I can keep BICC.org looking good on an iPad. And that, of course, is the point of this, is that, that you, know, you need to make your site work on all these different pieces of hardware. Um, so, for the hardware chaos, you've got still the old stuff, PC and Mac, PC and PC, iPhone, Android. Uh, Android is, is um, pretty chaotic in and of itself. It has all these different operating systems, like their latest one is Froyo, which I think would translate to maybe 2.5, does anybody know? Um, that, that's the one that's in development. 2.1 is what's currently on the, the droid, but you, you go, it ranges from 1.6 to whatever Froyo is that's in development. Um, then you've got iPad. I don't know if it's a tablet or not, but some people, like the New Yorker, is, is doing an article on iPad versus Kindle. Um, then there, there are up and coming. Uh, then this picture over here um, is actually not the iPad. It's, it's a competitor to the iPad. This is a tablet called the WePad coming out of Germany. They call it the anti-iPad. This, in fact, is what I would really, really like the Cancer Center to buy for me. So let's see. The mobile web um, is where, you know, it's, it's driving a lot of the, the chaos in the new operating systems. Mary Meeker... Uh, towards the end of last year, and, and then she re-emphasized it. She's at Morgan Stanley and, and is one of these thinkers that people pay attention to. She said that it is um, the future for the Internet, and she said that again fairly recently. We even have people my age joining the mobile web, um, and here's, here's a good article if you want to read on why you should be paying attention to mobile if you're not already. And then once you are paying attention, here's an article on how to do good design for mobile and some more, another article like that. Lastly, I just kind of wanted to give Annabelle's impressions of web fashions, which really isn't what we're looking at over there. That, that is, in fact, a network jacket that you can buy, I suppose, but that is, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, so the number one, I would say, web fashion is simplicity. There's this guy named Ben Hunt who did Save the Pixel, so it's like minimal. He wrote a book on this. It's, it's minimizing your sites whenever possible. Um, in, in menu fashion, uh, vertical navigation is um, going away to some extent, and what, what is hugely on the rise are, are mega drop-downs, uh, and even Jacob Nielsen, usability um, snot, really, uh, says that, that uh, mega drop-downs are a great way to go. Uh, here's another very geeky web fashion, which is Unicode, is now um, over 50% of the web. And even if you don't use that URL um, tag for, for your fonts, it, these days you can build better font stacks. Um, so more geeky web fashions. CSS3 is, is driving um, a lot of these web fashions. So Zurb, which is a company um, in the Bay Area, they're, they're one of the very top web design firms. They do Facebook and things like this. They design their super awesome button, and it's, it's a very CSS3. Let me see if we can actually go to the 
example of th super awesome buttons where we can see them in action. Um, where this is using all kinds of CSS3. So it's no, there's no, there are no graphics behind this. You, in the past, to do a look like this, you would have had to have done graphics. But it's, um, it's just CSS3 doing super awesome buttons. Um, so JavaScript is um, much more on the rise. It's, it's much easier to do JavaScript, especially uh, with, with tools like, or libraries like jQuery. Uh, one of the most popular things you see are what are called those carousels. They're replacing Flash, um, the, the tops of home pages in particular, where you have like a whole set of slides. Usually that's going to be a jQuery carousel these days, if it, unless it's Flash that's running those images. Oh, footers. Um, the lowly footer is, is getting a lot of attention these days. Uh, and rightly so, if you, you ask me. So you put this all together, and what I think you get is this. I don't know if you've looked at the redesign, but they're doing stuff like a super I'll get to duper. Your check later. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's that's my overview of um, uh, the the web in 2010. And now it's John's turn. What, does anybody have any questions? Oh, it's I have a question for John. Can you like take this video down real fast, John? <laughs> this is really great. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Um, so, does anyone have questions for me? I've left you speechless. Okay, I'll thank. Get that, um, we'll get the presentation out or a link to it because all those links are. Yeah, super they're all in the. That's great. Yeah, that's what I designed this for, so that you can go back and and look. And and I, what I tried to do was call out what I thought the best articles were to learn about Open Graph and HTML5 and CSS3 and all these things that are happening. That's excellent. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. So I've been doing this job uh, full time since 2006. For those of you who don't know me, I'm John Brazel from ITS. I'm the streaming media specialist. I think I'm the only person uh, at the university with that job title. And, uh, so uh, one of a kind. And uh, I think in all the time that I've been doing this, uh, this is also the first time that I'm actually recording myself. So not only am I enabling uh, other people's uh, viewing of this meeting, I'm actually providing the content, which is kind of a surreal kind of um, being John Malkovich type of thing for me, so you'll have to bear with me if I, if I get, get the shakes or anything like that. Uh, I deliberately did not um, bring a PowerPoint presentation um, taking a cue from the U.S. Army, um, who has a, a big flap right now about that, um, but I will bring up the, uh, the website uh, for our new uh, streaming media partner here in a second uh, when I start talking about uh, what we've done over the last uh, probably three or four months is engage the university community uh, to help find a, uh, a partner for streaming media uh, enterprise architecture. So we uh, engaged folks from the medical center and from the university to tell us what it is they thought they'd be doing with streaming media. And then we assembled a panel of uh, technical experts, uh, including some of the folks here in this room. Annabelle sat on the, the panel. Um, John had some input, John Tapp had some input, and let's see, is anybody else in here? I know De Denise Levesque in the back there was on our uh, business requirements panel. Um, so uh, we, uh, we basically identified who we thought were potential vendors. Uh, there were nine altogether. Uh, we started out with eight, and then somebody suggested we add another one, so we did that. We sent them a questionnaire. We had them fill that out. Uh, and then we took the, uh, the responses that they gave us and fed it to our panel of technical experts and, and had them evaluate the vendors. And uh, then we took the output from that and used it to develop a set of knockout criteria where we thought uh, we could eliminate some of the vendors for their inability to deliver in, in any of these, uh, I think it was altogether was eight or nine different criteria that we, that we came up with. And that left us with two standing at the end and we brought those two in. For, uh, for further um, explanation of their solution and uh, finally came to the conclusion that uh, Polycom uh, had a solution that met as many or more of the needs uh, than any other of the other vendors and I'll talk about that 
uh, in a little depth, a little more depth in a second. The solution is actually from a small company in uh, Northern California called Kumu, Q-U-M-U, and I'll bring them up here in a second. Um, but being a small outfit, they realized that they did not have the sales channel, um, so they are partnering with Polycom to, to resell their product, and in fact, uh, Polycom will, uh, will go through a... Uh, We'll go through a VAR here locally to provide integration uh, and deployment services. So as you can see, Polycom's name is featured prominently on the Kumu website. Um, so the, the solution that we were looking for had to do a bunch of different things well. One of the things that we heard about during the process uh, that we initially didn't think was going to be as big of a, uh, of a player as it was was um, the ability for uh, desktop publishing to be integrated into a streaming media architecture so that you wouldn't have to have uh, support staff necessarily involved in the process of uploading video to the web. Uh, and Kumu has a, a laptop-based uh, product called Kumu Create that does just that. It allows you to do a, Any of y'all in here use Camtasia or have heard of Camtasia? It's basically desktop publishing and capture software. So Create is kind of like that product, but the nice thing about it is, is it integrates into the back-end solution which provides you all the tracking, reporting, and searching. Uh, and, and the stuff that you want in an enterprise framework. Um, so that was a plus. Nobody else had that uh, in addition to all the other stuff that we wanted. They also have uh, uh, a pretty robust Blackboard implementation. Uh, that was really important that we also heard from a bunch of folks that they wanted the ability to easily post content created um, uh, through uh, the Kumu solution and, and otherwise uh, and make that available for Blackboard. Um, they also are uh, a, a partner with Microsoft for SharePoint integration. If you go to Microsoft and ask them, well, how do I get video into SharePoint, this is the solution that they give you. And uh, the, uh, the other thing, uh, and there are more, but uh, the other main thing that uh, we were looking for was someone who would be able to ingest lots of different kinds of content so that uh, you could create something in H.264 or in Windows Media or any other other myriad of formats out there and have something that was as flexible as possible to help preserve uh, the assets beyond perhaps the scope of whatever solution we come up with now, 15 years from now, uh, hopefully the, the assets that you guys create today will still be something that, uh, that's useful to you because we're using something that's open and standards-based as opposed to a proprietary solution. So um, what happens now, uh, after we, we just actually got the green light on this from our senior management in ITS on Wednesday, is that uh, we are working on getting some final pricing from our VAR. Uh, we hope to have that available for you guys to take a look at really soon, possibly even by the end of the day. Um, we're going to get a, a, a demo uh, unit in here for people to take a look at and, and actually touch and feel. We'll set it up in a, probably in a space like this so people can come in and see what it's all about. The, uh, the capture station itself is a really neat little box, and that's another one of the reasons that we picked them. It's, it's I think, probably the mo most robust capture station out there on the market. It allows up to three simultaneous video feeds in addition to a VGA capture. So one of the bad things about um, this presentation that we're streaming today is, is that the camera in the back of the room has got to be trained one place. It's either going to be on the speaker or on the slides, which is kind of akin to someone coming in and taking a, a digital picture of a computer screen in order to make an image. Um, we're doing the same sort of things today. Rather than capturing PowerPoints natively, uh, we're using the, uh, the camera to, to basically video a screen. And we can only do one thing at a time. With the, with the new capture station, you, we, can, uh, we can scrape the, the video right off the computer. And in addition, this little capture station has a neat feature of being able to do OCR from the VGA feed, which means you'll be able to create metadata on the fly. Uh, again, that's a unique uh, advantage of this particular solution that nobody else was able to offer. Um, so the idea is, is that we're going to move forward from the model that we have now uh, for most of, of campus. There are a few places that have integrated rich media presentation. Uh, Vanderbilt Hart has an accordance system that allows this type of integration of video and, uh, and, uh, and VGA capture. Uh, the uh, media site uh, solution is deployed in the medical school in a few large rooms at the Bill Wilkerson Center and in the Children's Hospital. Um, but those are really the only places on campus right now where if you want to integrate um, more than one input source, um, you have the capability of doing so. So there's really not an enterprise infrastructure for integrated video uh, 
uh, rich media capture, and that's what this solution brings. We're, we're hoping to get the big spots on campus, the most frequently used places like the Student Life Center. We're in there all the time recording uh, events for lots of different organizations. Um, there's a, a lot of activity in uh, places like uh, Flynn Auditorium in the law school, Langford Auditorium. Uh, we do a lot of stuff for Blair for the events that they put on there. So the idea is we're going to sort of spread this ecosystem throughout the campus and, and uh, enable the, the units and departments to be able to um, schedule, record, uh, monitor. Uh, one of the neat things about these kind of things is you can actually get an idea of not only what, you're, what people are watching, but for how long they've watched it, even track down to the individual user level. So if you're interested in doing like certification training for CLE or CME or something like that, this is the framework that's going to help make all that stuff happen. So I think that's probably um, as much as I can tell you without sort of making your eyeballs melt out of your head or your ears melt off. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to go into too much detail. I think it'll be better for you guys to be able to actually take a look. I, I would encourage you to go out to the Kumu website and have a look and see what they say about themselves. Uh, but as soon as we possibly can, we'll have a unit here for you all to look at and play with. Um, and uh, I guess at this point, I'd just like to go ahead and open up the floor for questions uh, specifically about um, this product or about uh, where we're going with streaming in general. So anyone have any questions? John? A uh, couple of questions. So what's the price point on the box? I mean, the model is the departments would buy a capture box to sell. Uh, Oh, so the question is, is what's the price point on the capture station and is the model uh, for, the, uh, for the departments to buy the capture stations themselves? For our initial deployment, ITS's, uh, our funding model for this first round is to uh, try and assist the departments uh, with either purchasing a capture station for a couple or three places uh, and then uh, hoping that people can bring some money of their own to the table for integration because there are, there are other elements that need to be added to doing uh, rich media conferencing interim. As you, I'm sure, are aware, you need to have cameras, you need to have microphones, and all that stuff needs to be tied together with some hardware glue. Um, so we're looking, uh, in, in the first round at least, to help, help out uh, in, that, in that area. Um, the price point for a, a box is uh, somewhere in the uh, $15,000 range. Um, that's, uh, that's for the capture station itself. Uh, the, the final pricing has yet to be determined, but that's the rough order of magnitude, somewhere in the mid-teens mid for each one of these things. The, uh, the Kumu Create solution, which is a laptop-based capture, which would allow you to plug a camera or whatever into it and do things from your desktop, is going to be right around $75 a copy. Um, Follow-up question is, is can we spend money on this stuff this year? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, we are uh, talking to the VAR today actually to get pricing for you guys. Uh, we also, ITS, are looking to spend some of our current fiscal year money to get the central infrastructure piece in place. So uh, the sooner the better. Uh, there, are all, there are other folks, uh, the Infectious Disease Department has some uh, money that they need to spend relatively quickly even before end of year. So uh, I impressed upon uh, Polycom uh, and our VAR that uh, we needed to be able to, uh, to get real pricing in front of people uh, sooner rather than later. And he told me that he could possibly have that ready as early as today. So if you're interested, a uh, salesman will call uh, and just let me know. Uh, I'm easy to get a hold of, john.brazel at vanderbilt.edu, and we can certainly get you in touch with the VAR to help uh, make this happen for you. So there's a kind of a combination of some Generally well, locations. there are there are a few key places that we go to a lot um, that um, don't really serve a particular organization uh, uniquely. A student life center ballroom is kind of about as agnostic of a space as there is. I can think of there. Everybody goes in there because there's not a lot of places like that on campus. Um, so it's. Uh, it's a place that we go a lot and that we know will get a lot of, uh, a lot of views. And the idea is to uh, encourage use of this uh, solution. So uh, we, we want to help get the deployment out. Um, the, I, the, the idea, though, is that uh, we, are, we are enabling people to schedule and 
capture their own content rather than it being a central service per se. I'm sure there will still be some of that aspect to it. And, and by the way, I should mention while I'm talking about that, that none of our existing services are going away anytime soon. The Helix server that we use, the Flash server that we use, the VBricks that we have, all that gear is still going to be around. So there's, there's not going to be this sudden, uh, like, you know, zero to one shift uh, of, of, of services. Uh, I expect that, uh, you know, hopefully over time, uh, the, the value and benefit of the new system will become evident to people uh, and that more and more folks will migrate onto that platform, but uh, none of what we're doing today is going away. And um, that model of, uh, of uh, central capture, I think, however, is going to shift more towards uh, the units being able to capture themselves. There's, at, in fact, even a, a, a place on the portal, the Kumu portal, for YouTube-like upload where people can put their own content up uh, with approval process as required so that we're, we're sort of um, moving the, uh, the equation uh, even farther out to the edges and, and, and enabling anyone who has the time and energy and interest uh, to, to publish themselves uh, using a high quality, measurable, quantifiable solution. So the question is, is are there going to be uh, standards and uh, training associated with this? Uh, the capture station itself is dead easy to use. It's one of those, it's a touch panel. You can uh, uh, just, you I know. I mean about video, good video capture, good online presentations, audio capture, all that stuff that we've talked about. I think we've talked about uh, some, some need for uh, uh, education in this space, uh, in fact, even in this form before. And I, and I certainly would, uh, would hope that there's a, there's a, university-led effort to, to develop best practices for content creation. Um, I mean, you can do um, a reasonably good job of putting uh, a presentation together at your desktop. That's a whole level, uh, there's a whole nother level of uh, a polish you can apply, though, in a, in a, a studio-like setting where you have uh, good lighting, good audio, uh, and so uh, the the levels of uh, the levels of expectation for the quality, I think, would depend on the on the purpose and, and on the audience for for what you're creating. But the short answer to your question is is yes, I certainly hope so. Uh, and uh, along those same lines, I would I would hope that we would be able to, uh, as much as we can, coalesce around a relatively small number of standards: H.264 uh, for video, MP3 for audio, those sorts of things. Um, Silverlight, uh, Flash. Um, uh, HTML5 for content delivery. Uh, which of those do we need to do? Do we need to do all of them? Uh, we, we have to have uh, video that works well on iPads, laptops, mobile devices. Uh, there's, there's input, there's management, and there's delivery, and all of those things need to be approached in kind of a holistic way. Uh, and so, uh, once again, uh, you, you need to have uh, standards in place, and those standards need to be as flexible as possible to accommodate all the different things that people want to do. Other questions? Uh, so, um, get with me. Uh, if you have money to spend now and want to spend it, I'll be happy to help you do that. Uh, I'm really excited about this. The upside, I think, for this technology is uh, just as uh, just about as high as the sky, uh, and uh, I. The last thing, the last message I want to leave you with is that even if I've gotten this completely wrong and this vendor turns out to be really terrible and I'm asking you, do you want low sodium zucchini fries on your, on your order the next time you see me, uh, that we, we tried to put a solution together that preserves your content so that, uh, that the, the, the thing that you really care about the most, the, uh, whether it be for training or for education or for research, um, is available to your audience. Um, for a long period of time and doesn't get stuck in some um, squabble between vendors somewhere and have to be uh, re-engineered from the ground up. So with that, uh, have a, a, a great summer, everybody. And uh, if, uh, if I can be of any assistance, like I said, I'm easy to find. My number is 22496, and my email is john.razzle at vanderbilt.edu. Hi, Mom. <laughs>